thank you very much um, to the organizers. Um, uh, it's wonderful being back in, uh, in Sydney after um, a 10 year hiatus. Um, also, thank you to the organizers for putting me uh, in the morning session because I think after lunch, I will probably decohere since I came in last night from London. And um, so I'm going to talk uh, about quantum imaging and, um, and it's actually going back, uh, not this particular talk, but it's going back to uh, my first encounter with uh, John Dowling, uh, which was um, actually via my uh, PhD supervisor, Sam Brownstein, who uh, met John at a conference. They'd known each other for a long time. Uh, and John was saying like, oh, I got this paper and the referees are giving me uh, a hard time. Uh, I need to, uh, you know, do some more calculations. And then Sam said, well, I've got a PhD student. He can do that. And um, so, you know, he explained the problem to me and, uh, you know, thought about it. And I did some calculations and then um, send it on off to, to John. And he said like, well, brilliant. Uh, uh, let's put you on the paper. And that was um, the paper by Boto, uh, Koch, uh, et cetera. Um, which was the first uh, quantum imaging paper, the quantum lithography paper. And so on the basis of that, I, uh, I thought like, yeah, it would be great to uh, work with him more. And um, uh, so I applied uh, for a, a fellowship and I had no idea that these were really hard to get. And so I didn't apply for anything else. And luckily I got it. So then went to JPL and I met John. And of course, you know, he's a fantastic uh, uh, character and, and, you know, it's great. Uh, you know, th thinking about all the memories, uh, uh, you know, mostly cherished. Uh, sometimes, you know, he could embarrass you very hard. Uh, but I think, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's good, right? Uh, okay, you know, within measure. Um, anyway, I just wanted to also say that um, uh, when I uh, was at JPL, it's actually the first time I met Barry Sanders. Um, and um, Barry um, had a, uh, I think, lost or won a bet, but regardless, you shaved your head and uh, because it was the first time I, I met you, I thought this was the normal way you look, but now you have hair. Um, right. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, but. <laughs> right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, quantum imaging as uh, a form of metrology. Um, and, and there are two aspects to this. Uh, one is uh, noise reduction in your measurements, and the other is super resolution. And they are really two quite different things. And in both cases, uh, a quantum metrology approach to imaging can actually um, lead to insights uh, uh, on how to improve uh, both of these. And then, um, so I'll, I'll give a, a bit of an overview of the, the stuff that I've done since no, for the last five years or so. Um, a very large chunk of it was uh, also done by Zijin and uh, our, um, uh, our organizer. Uh, so I wanna put that out there right at the front. And then uh, the last bit, the extended baselines for telescopes is work that uh, I've been doing with my current postdoc. Uh, and we've got a paper out just, um, a few weeks ago, just before Christmas. Um, right, so um, I'm going to skip over, um, I, I think, something that most of you will have encountered, namely uh, the Fisher information. Uh, and what I just want, I just want to remind you, uh, so what it does, um, it basically gives you an indication of how much information you can uh, uh, extract uh, about a particular parameter. Uh, in physics. So what you typically have is uh, a state preparation protocol P uh, creates some kind of quantum state rho. You let it evolve according to some parameter theta. So you end up with rho as a function of theta. And then you do some detection and you get a probability distribution over your measurement outcomes. The Fisher information is a functional over that distribution. And it tells you how much information you gain about theta and if you take the inverse, this will give you a bound on the variance uh, uh, in theta in your measurement procedure. Then you can ask, okay, well, in quantum mechanics, we can do all, all sorts of measurements. Uh, so we don't have to uh, stick to a particular observable or detection procedure D. And 
In particular, we can optimize overall possible measurements and then see how much information we get. And uh, we can calculate this, and this is called the quantum fissure information. And a nice thing about it um, is that you can just take the input state and, uh, or actually not, uh, you take rho of theta, the, the output state, before the detection, and you can calculate the fissure information um, uh, just on, based on the state. So you don't actually have to do the optimization uh, protocol, which is, uh, which is nice. Now, the important thing uh, is that um, you can apply the, both the classical or the normal fissure information on the left here and the quantum fissure information to both classical and quantum experiments. So, uh, so these are really two different things, and that's what we do. So often what we do is we look at a classical um, um, experiment and we want to calculate what is the classical fissure information, what is the quantum fissure information. If they happen to be the same, then you know that the classical experiment is already optimal and there's no, uh, no point in trying to uh, you know, do, do anything better for that particular input state. All right, with that out of the way, um, so my uh, postdoc, former postdoc, Yasmin de Sidhu and I, we wrote um, um, a review uh, article about, uh, about all of this. And so, um, yeah, it's a little advertisement also for AVS Quantum Science. Uh, we're doing a special issue for uh, in commemoration of John Dowling. So Gigi and I are uh, the editors uh, of that. And uh, I know a lot of you have already been uh, uh, approached and uh, the deadline is the 1st of March. Um, all right, so with that shameless plug out of the way. Um, so the first case of uh, metrology of uh, imaging as metrology is noise reduction. So this goes back to uh, around uh, 2016, 2017 with my um, then postdoc Mark Pierce. We were looking at um, um, the kind of information that you can extract from classical uh, sources, right? Because often quantum information, you're dealing with quantum mechanical sources. It's very sexy, but uh, also, you know, you want to basically look at something and then uh, that is, you don't have any control over, for example, in astronomy, and um, and then see, uh, you know, how much information can you get out. So uh, Mark developed like a detector model. And um, so we capture the state of the light in, in these two detectors. So we, we need at least two detectors if we want to say something about the shape of this black body. Uh, and then we calculate the fissure information uh, for whatever uh, uh, parameters we care about. For example, if it's spherical, we may, maybe want to know the, the or uh, circular, we may want to know the radius, uh, or we want to know the position, you know, you name it. And, um, and we used the von Sittert Seneca theorem, uh, which relates the coherence in the imaging plane between two points to um, the, the intensity distribution in the source plane. Oh, I do it in exactly the wrong way around, right? So here we have the image plane and you take two points in the image plane and you wanna know what is the coherence of the light between those two points that, that, uh, that was emitted in the, in the source plane. And the, the von Sittert Seneca theorem says, if you know these complex degrees of coherence, the, so, so basically the coherence between R1 and R2 in your image plane, you work that out, you can, uh, you, you, you do this for many, many points, not just two, and you take the inverse Fourier transform and you end up with uh, an image of the source. So that's really nice. And, um, uh, and so we wondered, okay, so then what is the optimal way in which you can measure this complex degree of coherence? And then of course you have, so you have your two R1 and R2 coming in, and those are two modes. So what we can do is we can take the most general two modes uh, observable, um, well, at least in linear optics, and see um, how can we measure this. And um, so we need to find some phase, phi, and some beam splitter reflectivity. And uh, the optimal phase setting uh, turns out to be equal to the phase that we need to estimate. And so that's no good. So initially we thought like, okay, well, this was a dead end. However, um, uh, you, you can say like, okay, yeah, we need to do this in an adaptive setup, but uh, you know, that, that works. But there's another way. Uh, we can choose random phases and see where that gets you. And so this is what, what 
uh, Mark looked at, um, didn't want to give up, which is you know, very good. And so we found a surprise. We find that the uh, ratio between the classical uh, fissure information and the quantum fissure information, uh, that's essentially what's here, stays one for a very, very long time, and then it sort of drops off to zero. So if you have uh, an A here is the, uh, the magnitude of the complex degree of coherence. So that's between zero and one. So that means that unless you have like ultra uh, correlated uh, light, which means you know, you, you're gonna be very close, uh, looking very close together, you actually have an incredibly high um, fissure information, um, even if you just you know, chuck a bunch of random phases uh, out there. So that, that's, um, that's very nice. And so uh, then what um, uh, that leads then to an experiment, which was done by uh, Andrew White and his group. And so here we had this, basically the same situation as right at the, at the, at the top, uh, uh, where we have, um, we want to know, we want to create a little spot and we want to know what is the diameter of that spot. Um, uh, and, you know, and then here we have, there's, there's more length. Uh, you know, more distance here we want to, because we're looking that far away. And so what we get is uh, a laser. Uh, we uh, have a, um, a spinning ground glass disc, which cre basically creates uh, a completely incoherent light source. And um, so it's focused. It, we can measure very directly what the size of this spot is. And then we can also um, sort of do our um, optimal um, uh, measurement and uh, because Andrew has these uh, transition edge sensors uh, these are you know really fancy um, uh, superconducting photon counters so they tell you exactly how many photons there are and he's got two so we got uh, we got to do this experiment well they got to do the experiment I was just sitting back in England um, right okay so uh, it's quite cool um, we had sort of the traditional scheme where we had a fixed phase, which is a little bit like getting just a lens uh, in front of um, uh, a CCD camera. So more like traditional imaging. And we had our count, what we call the count scheme. And what we do here is um, uh, we show the, uh, so the error bars is what, what's the interesting part here. So here we have the, the magnitude of the complex degree of coherence. So previously called A, and then here we have the, uh, the phase of the complex degree of coherence. And you can see we can measure the magnitude much, much more precisely because the blue is the, uh, the optimal um, uh, um, procedure, the, the count scheme, and the, the error bars are much, much smaller. Uh, the traditional fixed uh, phase also gives you um, a, a systematic error. And then in terms of the phase, we still get quite a bit of an improvement over the, uh, the traditional scheme. So we were very happy when we saw this, uh, sent it off to uh, physical review letters, and then uh, we got um, um, very nice um, uh, reviews, uh, as you can see, because it got in. However, uh, one of the reviewers uh, asked, well, but yeah, but what does this actually mean uh, when you have a, you know, an actual image? So then uh, we uh, did something that I think would have made John Dowling proud, um, we put uh, in the paper, in physical review letters, a picture of Dorian Gray. And uh, so we had this um, uh, a simulated array of 26 by 26 uh, detectors. And so we took the noise of the complex degree of coherence. And uh, so we had this picture. This would be if there was no noise, but you would, um, uh, you would reconstruct it with, um, so in a noiseless way. This is the reconstruction uh, with the traditional scheme. And then here we have the reconstruction with the, um, uh, the optimal method. And so you can see there is no gain in resolution, but there is a, a considerable improvement in uh, uh, you know, reduction in the noise. So it's, it doesn't show up too well on the screen, but on, um, uh, in print, it's really clear. So yeah, we got a pun into PRL. Uh, so uh, if you want to do sort of think, think big, uh, what you can do is um, have these random phases 
Um, so I called it a random face mark, mask at first. And then uh, my experimentalist friends told me, actually, this is, this is well-known technology. It's called, called a stochastic light field modulator and they exist. Um, so we need a beam splitter. Uh, and so that can be done with you know, some, kind of, uh, some kind of lens setup. And then we need our, our photon counters. Yeah, CCD camera, uh, you really do need to count uh, photons. So, um, so that's going to be an expensive uh, thing. It probably also uh, requires some substantial data processing. And um, yeah, so that's uh, something that we could uh, uh, look into if we really want to develop these things. Um, the, yes. Yes. Uh, we haven't looked at that. So um, uh, I doubt it because, um, uh, because I think you want to have a direct line to the intensity. Um, uh, so so fo photon number, seem this is also single frequency. Um, yeah, I think so, I think so. But um, I have to think about that, yeah. Um, and maybe we can discuss afterwards, yeah. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, so what we want to do next is uh, look at super resolution. So uh, traditionally, when people talk about resolution, they uh, look at, uh, of, a, of a particular imaging system, they look at the point spread function, then they have two points and then uh, move them close enough together so that their uh, point spread functions start to overlap. And if you can't, cannot see, um, you know, the, the two dots. So here you can still see it's two dots. Here you can't really see that anymore. Then you know that you've, uh, you've, you've met the limit. Um, so this is the, the ABBA diffraction limit. Uh, this is in his um, hometown uh, university where they put this uh, memorial plaque on with the famous ABBA formula. Um, and that's him. He worked with Carl Zeiss. So um, you know, we're, we're doing all these things uh, because we want to, you know, build technology. And of course, you know, they did that way back uh, as well. So now when we want to get a super resolution, there was a very, uh, there's a famous paper by Mankai Tsang and uh, I think his student or postdoc um, in 2016, which actually showed that this diffraction limit is a, is a complete artifact of your imaging system because you can build a different imaging system that doesn't have this diffraction limit at all. And so here's the, uh, the argument. Let's have uh, two, um, uh, two point sources, incoherent point sources, and there's some distance S apart from each other. And so you can imagine the point spread functions in the imaging system, they're going to be massively overlapping if S is like, uh, if they're, uh, S is small enough. So uh, what they showed uh, uh, is that we can, um, we can measure any separation S, uh, even if this is much, much smaller than the ABBA limit. And the way you do this is um, you, take, um, you, you, you take the, uh, the position of the two sources, right? And, um, and you, uh, so you have a wave function. And now you're going to translate your sources uh, a, a small amount, S. So what does that uh, look like when you take a Taylor expansion of your wave function? Well, you're going to get a first derivative in here. However, uh, if you take a derivative of a, of a Gaussian, uh, you're going to get um, the, you know, a Hamid polynomial, and that's orthogonal to what you had before. So we end up with some orthonormal functions and uh, if you uh, put them together through this uh, like mode separator called spade, then you can separate those and you can actually measure by looking at how many uh, of these, um, um, you know, you do these measurements uh, multiple times and, and you get, um, uh, you can infer what S is and there is no lower limit to S. Now, does that mean that we have unlimited super resolution? Unfortunately, no. Because um, this only this argument only works when the, the two um, intensities of the two sources are exactly the same, and so uh, so here the here the Q um, the blue line 
uh, Q is one half and Q is basically the, the fraction of uh, each source. And you can, so you can see as the, the distance, or so here it's D, but you know, I called it S before. If, if you take that to zero, the blue line remains, uh, uh, you know, remains high. Whereas if you do some direct imaging, then at some point the diffraction limit kicks in and your, the, um, your information about, um, uh, about the distance between the two point sources drops to zero, right? So, th so the, 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 the yellow line, that's your diffraction limit. And then, uh, but when you have different intensity, so for example, if you have exoplanet detection, when you have a bright star and a, and a very faint planet, then this argument doesn't uh, hold anymore. And you'll see that um, it actually goes down the, the maximum position that you can achieve. It also drops to zero, but it drops to zero slower than, um, than, than in your um, classical diffraction um, limited um, situation. Okay, so there's still room to, uh, to improve our telescopes. Um, and then uh, we looked at uh, 3D positioning and uh, see like, well, what can we actually uh, measure when we have a whole cluster of incoherent point sources? And so what you can do is, for example, uh, construct a single coordinate for, for example, for the center of, of gravity of these sources, assuming that they're all the same or, um, you know, the, the, the largest distance between the two. Any combination of the three uh, coordinates of all those n sources, you can construct into a parameter that you can then measure. And the way you measure them, you collect them in a, a collection plane and send them through a linear optical interferometer. So we don't need anything fancy, just beam splitters and phase shifters, and then photon counting. And if you do that, then uh, you can construct the optimal way in which you can image the uh, or get extract the information about the parameter that you just constructed, right? So, um, so linear optical interferometry and photon counting is actually optimal um, for this kind of imaging um, application. So, um, so yeah, so we estimate a single generalized parameter theta, so that can be a combination of many, many different spatial coordinates. Um, we can calculate the quantum fissure information for that particular uh, coordinate. Uh, we can construct an interferometer R that yields a classical uh, fissure information because we do photon counting. So we have a classical fissure information over the photon counting distribution. And then we showed that the classical fissure information actually uh, is equal to the quantum fissure information. Hence, we have the optimal measurement. So that's, that's the argument in this paper with Cosmo and uh, Zizhen, who did the hard work, of course. Um, now, uh, the conclusions uh, are twofold. Um, measuring a spatial property of a set of thermal light sources can be achieved optim optimally using linear optical interferometry. So that's really nice. And second, the optimal measurement beats the upper limit and it's therefore proper super resolution. So basically the take home message is, you know, the, the big lenses and telescopes that we've been constructing, they are suboptimal and we want to use quantum uh, tricks to uh, to do better. Right, so um, just very briefly, uh, there is also, because, you know, I'm in Australia, this picture is taken. Um, I want to say around here, that's a broad uh, category, right? It's, it's a big country. Um, th by the way, this is a horse, right? There's two people here. So these are some some big big bad boys, they were like you know, 140 meters apart. Yeah, they were on a track, so you could, you could change the distance between these two. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so this, of course, the famous Henry Brown and Twiss uh, 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 multi-photon interferometry experiment. And the, uh, the cool thing there is that you can make your baseline really, really large, because one of the things that uh, you can use in order to get a better resol resolution is to make your baseline much, much larger. And, um, you know, it has some pros and some cons. Um, first of all, yeah, so what I said, you can make a really, really large baseline, 
Uh, however, you, you require photon coincidences. So you need, two you need to record two photons in your setup. Uh, but when you're looking at thermal light in every mode, uh, you have uh, only a very small fraction, maybe a uh, tenth of a percent for optical frequencies, um, tenth of a percent uh, of single photon contribution. And so even less, even though there is, there is bunching in thermal light, uh, your, set, your two photon contribution is way, way lower. So you, you are looking intrinsically at a very weak signal with uh, Henry Brown twist interferometry. And so we were wondering, okay, so are there any uh, like uh, regions where um, second order interferometry can beat first order interferometry? And so um, we worked together with Joachim von Zantier and his group in Erlangen. And, um, and so we did uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, comparisons between different kinds of uh, uh, actual telescopes. So uh, the blue, this is really our uh, analysis. Uh, when we have a, 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 you know, um, a Hambry brown twist type interferometer, then we have the ELT. Uh, so two types of ELT. So this is the, this is the extremely large telescope somewhere in Chile. Wait. Uh, which is not operational yet, I believe. Then there's Chara, and then there is the VLT. So these are all actual uh, interferometers. And so on the vertical axis, we have the, the precision that you, uh, that, that you can achieve. And, um, uh, and here the idea is that bigger is, uh, is better. And, um, uh, and we, again, we have Q, which is the, uh, the, the, the difference between uh, the two um brightnesses of two uh um yeah um the two sources and so you can see that um there are uh very specific use cases where um two photon interference actually outperforms the uh, single photon interference and you can see that the uh sort of the baseline is going to be much lower than um than the regular in, in from regular telescopes um, but it stays flat for a much longer time and then it, and it drops off off the cliff. So this all depends on your use case, right? So you can put really, really large baselines together um, uh, with this, and that's what gives you this sort of uh, this extra um, uh, sensitivity, but then um, we, you have to deal with a much lower uh, signal. Right. Um, then, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, so um, another question is, okay, well, we're looking at something far away and uh, do we have one or two sources, right? So very relevant uh, today with, because um, for example, um, I think Kepler does the uh, transition uh, detection anyway, but most of the time when you want to do um, exoplanet detection, what happens is, you have to be lucky that your planet goes exactly across the sun, so you see a little dip in your uh, uh, in your intensity. And you know most uh, most planets will not be in that particular configuration. So uh, we want to be able to uh, tell whether we have uh, you know just a star or whether we have a star and a very faint little planet next to it. Um, so that's. Um, uh, that's a different kind of question than uh, like uh, precision metrology. Uh, it's more like hypothesis testing. Do we have one um, uh, source or do we have two sources? And so we actually don't use the, um, the Fisher information here. We use the, the relative entropy. Oh, not there yet. Um, so we worked with um, a group in Harriet Watt, uh, Ugo Zanforlin and Gerald Buller. And they have a very nice interferometer uh, with, uh, with an air gap and a feedback control loop. So they, they have an extremely precise um, uh, interferometer. And uh, so we did a similar thing. So we had various masks here with uh, different, uh, different sized holes. So two holes, but, but different sized. So we could look at uh, um, you know, different, different relative intensities, also different distances between them. And again, uh, we send light through, um, and we uh, we used uh, um, uh, phase modulation and amplitude modulation, again to make these 
uh, make this incoherent light, right? Because um, we want to have incoherent light because that's what the use case is. And then we calculate the relative entropy and measure um, uh, the, uh, the, the relative entropy as well. And um, what we find um, is this, and we have uh, the green line is direct imaging. Relative entropy higher is better because it basically is another um, indicator of the precision of your uh, procedure. Um, so the two modes, quantum relative entropy, so the, the you know, best you can do is this blue line. And uh, you can see it's shallower as um, in epsilon here. I should have started with that. Uh, this is your fraction of the intensity of your uh, weakest source. Right, so you imagine you have like a, a, a star, and then you have like um, a planet that is only a, a thousandth of, uh, of of that that uh, that brightness. Um, so um, so then uh, we have the direct imaging, which has a sort of drops off much much steeper when uh, when your your um, planet gets dimmer, and uh, and then the experimental data is uh, is this uh, the, the crosses here. Uh, because we, every every cross is a different mask, right? So we have a finite number of, of masks. And you can see it really, really closely hugs the optimal quantum relative entropy. And at some point, around 10 to the minus 2, it starts to drop. And, and it becomes sort of the, the slope uh, becomes different. And it's, it seems like it's... When I look at the paper, I'm, I'm re, maybe I'm at a funny angle, but it starts to to really resemble this this slope here. However, because it's started, you know, further up, it, you still get a massive improvement um, compared to uh, uh, compared to direct imaging. So uh, then uh, we can translate that into a precision uh, in the angular separation. And, um, and this is for a given uh, epsilon, and I forget now exactly what the value was, but um, you can see that the quantum Fisher information for the set angular separation is, um, is the blue line here. Um, then we have experimental data, and we have the, the direct imaging. And here, lower is better. So you can see that we have a, a fantastic, um, so because of the mean square error, so that you want to make that small. And uh, oh, and, and the yellow band, and I should have said that in the previous slide as well, there was a yellow curve that tracked the experimental data really uh, well. The yellow band is the um, theoretical um, modeling of the reduced visibility in the interferometer, because they know exactly what the, what the visibility is in the interferometer, because you calculate that uh, directly from the data. And when we take that into account, it pretty much accounts for well, okay, uh, more or less accounts for the uh, uh, the entirety of the like the reduced uh, precision. Right. So, and then in, for the final uh, part, what I want to talk about is uh, um, well, you've probably all seen this fantastic uh, image of the black hole where they used telescopes from across the globe. Um, basically, the entire Earth became the, the numerical aperture. And they, um, Peter was talking about what is the best um, uh, uh, data uh, throughput, and it's basically just you know um, uh, CDs in a container. In this case, it was uh, hard drives in a backpack, uh, and they all uh, took it from the the various telescopes together. Huge amount of data. What they could do this because it was in the radio uh, frequency range, so they could measure both the amplitude and the um, and, and the phase of the of the radio waves, and so they could do interferometry uh, purely computationally. And so, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this in optics? Okay, this is behind a big dust cloud, and so we wouldn't be able to see it in optics. But that's beside the point, right? I want to do something like this, um, you know, on a really really large scale, but in optics. And so uh, the idea. Uh, that um, we were ah, it's going too quick. Doesn't matter. Ah, actually, uh, does it go back? Yeah. Um, there. Okay. So the idea is we want to receive. Uh, this is this is a telescope, and um, and so this is there. This these ideas have been floating around um, for a while, but um, so we, what we want to do is we have uh, a big telescope with two receivers, right? Potentially many more than two. 
but let's look at two first. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to basically identify uh, what is the direction of uh, the light, because you know the, the better uh, you can estimate this angle theta, you know, the, the better you can sort of pinpoint your source in, uh, uh, in the sky. And so we want to uh, do, do the best possible precision for theta. And uh, so this is now a meteorology problem. And what we want to do what we want, uh, is somehow we need to uh, have coherence between uh, the receiver on the left and the receiver on the right, because uh, if we just measure something over here and, uh, and we measure something over there, then because the, the phase shift, the phase phi, which relates to theta, is, is a, a relative phase between these two receivers, right? We, we can't just do things locally. And so there are lots of really interesting proposals about putting, um, uh, putting repeaters and, uh, and that's really, really difficult technology. We just don't have that yet, you know, quantum memories and all that. So, um, so our thought was, well, what can you do with the stuff that we do have? So for example, what if we have some uh, single photon sources Right? And we send them through beam splitter, 50-50 beam splitter. So the photon goes you know, to both uh, receivers in, a, in, a, in an equal superposition. And then, um, and this is where I want to move. Yeah, so, um, so we have this photons going both ways. Then we have our, um, uh, these linear optical interferometers. And in fact, we just took quantum uh, Fourier transforms. Right? So, um, so basically generalized beam splitters, 50-50 beam splitters. And, um, uh, and then we have our, uh, whatever light is coming in from, from the receiver also goes in uh, into these. And then we do photon counting uh, on, the, uh, on the output there. And what we're going to say is these detectors, they all have very high efficiency. So this is because we have those detectors. I don't, but they exist. And they're expensive, but if Andrew White can have two uh, uh, transition edge sensors, then I'm sure we can find, you know, uh, government money to get, you know, uh, 10, 15, I don't know. Um, so, um, and then the source is assumed to be thermal and uh, uh, sufficiently uh, transversely coherent. So it's basically looking at light coming from very far away. Um, and uh, so that we have, uh, so when we do have a photon, it's basically uh, in, a, in a pure state uh, that's, that's indicated at the top there. Then, because we want to make our baseline really, really large, um, we're going to, to take a hit in uh, how many photons we can uh, send through because, so we're gonna have a lot of loss when our photons are going to our receivers. Um, so, uh, you know, we, if you, you can have fibers uh, with attenuation length of like you know, 10 kilometers, it's like, you know, the really expensive stuff. Um, that's what we want to play with. And, um, and so we know that if we push them too far, then we're basically not getting any photons through. Um, uh, and at the same time, we have, you know, almost no photons coming in, uh, you know, because we have a, a thermal state, which is mixed. So we get mostly vacuum in, each, in every mode. And then we get a little bit of single photon. That's the state that I showed earlier. And then, you know, you got your two photon stuff, which is negligible. And so we don't really know if we find, if we measure photons, we don't really know which photons came from where. So, um, you know, this, this, could, this could not work out all that well, uh, but of course it, it, it kind of does work out well because we calculate the fissure information for um, systems like this. Um, I forget exactly what the star emission rate epsilon is here, but it's, I think it's, um, you know, half or something. Uh, uh, no, 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 not half, about a percent. Uh, the point here is that um, if I have, so n equals two, what does that mean? It means one photon coming from the star and one photon that is made in the lab that goes to uh, the two receivers. Um, n equals three, one photon from the star, two photons in, in parallel uh, going to the receivers and so on. And so you can see that the slope um, 
sorry, no, epsilon here, right? Um, so the, the, the slope goes, it, it gets steeper as you put in more and more photons. Basically, what that means is uh, you get, um, you know, lots of photons are going to be lost, but enough gets through uh, so that you establish coherence between your two receivers that still allows you to extract the information uh, about the position, about the, the phase that we wanted to know. And uh, so more photons is better. That's the, uh, uh, now, that's not, uh, that's not true from a, um, uh, a modeling perspective because we found that five was pretty much the highest that we could go uh, because there don't, doesn't seem to be much in the way of simplification once you take into account uh, uh, the losses that, uh, that allow you to make the, uh, you know, get uh, analytic results here. So N equals five was the, the biggest that we could do. And, uh, and then uh, there are two things here. Um, so the Fisher information scales linearly with epsilon, which is a little bit of a surprise, but I think I'll skip over that for now. Um, so, but there's two, two aspects here. So we don't know where the photons get lost. So that is a lack of information, which is bad, which would suggest that our, um, our Fisher information will, will actually go down. However, we also, more photons mean you know, more possibilities of not knowing which photon was lost, but also there is more coherence that you establish. So these are two competing um, uh, effects. And then uh, that means that there's probably going to be some optimal distance between the two receivers um, uh, with some optimal resolution. And the hope is that um, uh, when you increase the number of photons that you actually also increase the, um, uh, the resolution. Uh, and so this is the, um, the money shot, so to say. And uh, so here we again have uh, two photons. This is now lower is better, right? So, uh, so we get down to, uh, so you see that increasingly, the, um, uh, if you increase the pho photon number, you improve the resolution. That's, that's very nice that that happens, but you also see that, okay, it's a logarithmic scale, but you do see a little bit of diminishing return. They, they you know, they, you get less, um, you know, each time. And um, so here is um, some, some actual numbers. So if we put, uh, we, we took um, 628 nanometers because, you know, that's a nice multiple of two pi. And um, so, but it's optical. And so what is the, the actual uh, minimum uh, micro arc second um, resolution that you can achieve? Uh, you achieve that with, um, so, well, that's so like 10 to 20 uh, micro arc seconds, which is actually comparable to the, um, uh, to, to the, the whole earth in, uh, um, uh, in numerical aperture, because you, you gain in the frequency of your, uh, of, because you're looking in optics, not in radio. So that increases your resolution. Uh, but uh, you also uh, have to decrease the size of your telescope because we, we, we can go four to five times the attenuation length of a fiber, right? Because we don't do free space because then, um, well, it has other problems. Um, and then there is, you know, some optimal phase that is uh, a detail that I'll refer to you in, uh, in the paper. Right, so very quickly, some conclusions. We can reduce the noise in an image. Um, we can increase the resolution uh, of the imaging system beyond the upper limit. And this is already sort of working with classical sources of light. So we don't need to you know, like uh, engineer anything here other than the, the detection mechanism. Um, and because, yeah, uh, that's what I said. And then um, there, you know, we've been involved with plenty of experiments that show that this is actually feasible. And finally, if it comes, Yeah, so by exploring coherence uh, across, wow, yeah, this is what, this is what I was, uh, anyway, uh, conclusions, yeah, there you go, uh, right, so um, thank you very much, not one more, uh, can I do it, yeah, um, so we can extend the baseline of uh, telescopes, great, we can extend the baselines of telescopes without quantum repeaters or quantum memories 
Now, it, this is not a magic bullet because it's, at some point it stops uh, and, and your, 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 your noise goes right back up again. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, I think that's because it's with experimentally uh, accessible technology, I think that's actually a big deal. And so with that, finally, we can go to the last slide and uh, thank you very much. Andrew? I think it's bad. Uh, it's your face. face you, I think it's essentially one large interferometer, right? So your face stability is going to be. Um, I haven't thought about it, you know, in, in very much detail, uh, but I suspect um, that you are going to have to. Um, yeah, you have to stabilize it, right? So it's. Uh, No, I think it's an optical wavelength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's so, so the the model that we use is that your the probability that your fiber so you have a a, a length l uh, of your fiber and uh, uh, and then the the probability that your um, your photon makes it through is uh, uh, e to the minus l over l naught. Well, l naught is the attenuation length of the fiber. Yeah. 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 Um, and so the human face on the 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 rate at which that thing makes the photon and that's the way we sort of sort of track the photon to see the sensitivity and activity of the photon. Yeah. Do you know what sort of rate the human comes up with by doing the uh the different rates of carbon? Yeah. So because you're looking at single frequencies or single modes uh, from your light, you, you're not going to get a whole lot of photons from your star in the first place. And the only thing you, you, you're, that, that's the only thing that you really need to match. So, so you, you, you can get away with a relatively low throughput. Uh, now, having, having said that, um, if you're looking at solid state single photon sources, uh, they can be made quite indistinguish indistinguishable from each other and fast. So, um, so, so mega, tens of megahertz uh, uh, should be, you know, completely fine. So, so it's that single photon that can pick out where it's going. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I have not looked at what you can do if you have, like, then you're looking at some kind of heterodyne type. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk to you about that.